<laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is Bob Sham. I'm Angela. The sounds you hear may be dogs. And we continue with our theme this month called Portraits of the Artists. Mm-hmm. In which we examine uh, movies by two major leading black men. We are, every Monday we're picking up a classic Paul Robeson starring vehicle. And I named it Portraits of the Artists after the Criterion collection of Paul Robeson stuff called Portraits of the Artists. So most of the time we're talking about Denzel, but today we're back in the silent movie business. Mm-hmm. I don't know how hopping these will be, but it is kind of important to study the history of Paul Robeson. But, you know, a lot of times he had to go overseas to make the kind of movies he wanted. Mm -hmm. And this is no exception. We go to Switzerland for this one. But it seems like the people involved in this movie are from all over the Western world. Uh, This is a very bohemian movie. It's called Borderline from 1930, directed by Kenneth McPherson. And it stars Paul Robeson, Eslanda Robeson, his wife, Gavin Arthur, Hilda Doolittle. It's a silent movie from the 30s uh, that we did have talkies at this point, but this movie, it's more of like a experimental bohemian thing inspired by modern artists from Germany and Russia. Yeah, it feels very much like an art film. I said to Absolutely. you at one point that if you told me this was filmed in the 60s or 70s as an art film, I would believe you a thousand percent. Because it does feel very ahead of its time in that there are same-sex yeah. Couples in this in this movie, there are interracial relationships in this movie, which is kind of the the impetus of like the the issue here. The entirety of the movie is almost the in the in the the fallout from an interracial affair mm-hmm. that was done between the character as the lead by Paul Robeson. The Please affair bo- so Astrid's husband's name is Thorne. Paul Robeson's name is is it Joe or Pete? Pete. Pete. Pete's wife had an affair with Thorne, who is Astrid's right. husband. That's the inter- And Pete has been away. This is my understanding, is that Pete has been away, and his wife has been fucking around with this white man. And he comes back into town, and he's staying up to, on top of this bar owned by a lesbian couple. Right. And there's all these, like, other kind of, like, art people there, but also, like, this old late, these couple old lady and old man who kind of have, like, very... Uh, they're there to conservative opinion to be racist essentially to- yes and so Astrid Thorne's wife calls the bar at the beginning and asks for Pete and though Pete will not come to the phone the fact that the owner of the bar says Pete will not come to the phone lets Astrid know Pete's back in town so she says to her husband's mistress who for some reason is in her house yeah you yeah. need to go back to Pete And she says, oh, go back to Pete and leave Thorne for you. And I thought this was a different sort of story because at the beginning there is this scene where it seems as though Thorne is possibly scaring Pete's wife. I can't think of her name. Let's talk about the actors involved here, the players involved in this. The guy who plays Thorne is Chester A. Arthur's grandson. And I didn't know who that was. I'm just going to admit that I forgot that that was a president. He was a former president, president, like the 21st president. Yeah. And a lot lot of other people involved were like authors and poets. Like the person who uh, played Astrid um, went under the name H.D. And... She called herself Helga Dorn, but she was also the author and poet uh, Hilda Doolittle. Mm. And she actually had a relationship with the butchier barmaid in real life. Mm. And and Gavin Arthur had a relationship with the other person who ran the bar in real life. And so, yeah, this is just like a, a bohemian puppy pile. And Pete was married to Esmeralda. And right. so everybody Is- Islanda. was... Islanda, sorry. And, yeah, so this is just all... It's like your, like, well-to-do college kids all coming together to make, like, little film projects. It definitely felt like a... We're all just friends, and I want to make this, so I'm just going to put all my friends in it. But they all did a great job, I think. It was well acted. Well, the the aspects of the movie that are very interesting and are far out of the time are the angles of it. And when we start, there is, like, this, like, sense of momentum, some Mm. speed. And then the camera angles will be, like, camera angles up from the ceiling pointing down and camera angles. Like, every kind of angle you can come up with 
is just experimented on and presented in and this like, movie. Tricky stuff where it'll be like back and forth shots of like his face, the sky, his face, the sky, his face, the sky. And even for a silent movie, it didn't feel like there were that many words that came up. Like no. it just it almost it the movie felt like it was trying to do as little uh, words as it possibly could. Mm -hmm. And maybe, just maybe, you could have grasped it all without really getting any words. Mm -hmm. But there's this, but a lot of it is about like experimenting with like the character interactions, the emotional displays, which often are very heightened for silent movies. And this is no exception. But I feel like once the character of Thorne is, um, is confronting Astrid. This movie's only about an hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. long. And like all uh, silent movies, most of them, you can find them pretty easily. This is on YouTube. You could just go and watch this movie. And this movie being only an hour and 15, long, uh, hour 15 minutes long, admittedly felt longer. Yes. It did drag ass, especially in the part in which Thorne and Astrid are confronting, which leads to Thorne stabbing Astrid. But it felt like it took 15 minutes it took, in this struggle. Uh, it was admittedly it was boring I in that part. Fell asleep. It was it was very boring. I was struggling. Yeah. yeah. Be because you think something's going to happen and you think something's done and then they just kind of go back into it. And I think they played their parts well. When I say it was well acted, like they they very clearly played their parts. It, that to me is in the direction like they're just not moving it forward it's like just keep going keep going the paul robeson character with his he's playing opposite his wife you don't really get that anything is too wrong until islana founds finds out that as like between them they just seem fine right they're just kind of like rekindling their relationship or whatever it they seem to strange so but yeah but robeson does exude something right he really does exude like a certain charm and like you yeah. can tell here that even though you know what minimal he has to work with he really is kind of above everyone else in this and movie. he gets top billing on this movie as he should as he should but even in his nuances and his present and how he presents himself everything seems so small but it it's a lot more breathless than the way everyone else is who everyone else is like just a little overwrought yeah he's he is why you watch this movie. Right. He literally is why we wa we're watching this movie. But when Islanda finds out that... That, that Thorne killed Astrid. Then she gets becomes distraught about it and just leaves him. Yeah, she writes Pete a letter that says, this is basically my fault. Yeah. Or I feel as though this is my fault and I just need to go. So at the end of the movie... Neither one of them gets her, and Thorne is acquitted, and he comes to, like, confront Pete. But at that point, the woman's gone, yeah. and there's literally no point. And I loved this because the bar owners, the lesbian couple, and the piano player, who's a guy, they basically stand up for Pete. Yeah. Because they get also a decree that he has to leave. Like, they get the bar people get sent a letter that we heard that you have a black man staying in your rooms, and... He, that's not okay. and But they were like, this is stupid, whatever, you can stay. But eventually he's like, no, I just, but Pete just I need to move to on. Because now his lady's gone. He doesn't want to cause these people trouble. This movie is a fascinating study because mm -hmm. it, it does present a lot of things that are ahead of its time. And we, you know, we discussed Citizen Gain and um, how the certain angles it presents in that mm -hmm. are ahead of its time. But this movie also shows those angles. But this is this movie was apparently lost up until like the eighties. Yeah, I think it and was refound in like eighty three. Yeah, as much as it drags in a lot of parts, it is kind of if you're interested in film history, and um, you know, seeing certain ways represented far ahead of their time. Yeah, uh, like and this is an example of like you know the Bohemian Bohemian culture of nineteen thirties in Europe, and it's so weird because you know Europe, you know, just like what five. Five, six years later would be just fucking ground into a war. Yeah. And it's another example I can match in uniform. I think where that's we, why this got lost. Yeah. Where we see things so far ahead of its time. And then right after something that seems so breathlessly ahead of its time, everything regresses even harder than it do, mm -hmm. did before. Well, and because those are the kind of things that the people who were trying to push down. Yeah. That's what they were against. Yeah, it was like uh, like a two steps, one step forward, two steps back kind of scenario. Yeah. And 
it's kind of scary to think about it. I don't think we're immune to this kind of thing no, here at, at all. all. Not, not at all. all. And it's just kind of a lesson to be learned and just observing that. So I do think this is a movie that is studied in film classes. Sure, it would be. Because of everything that you just said. Yeah. So it is possible that if you're someone who is studying film, you've seen this. But maybe otherwise you haven't. But it is it is really interesting. But like, drink a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, this is an experimental art film, and mm-hmm. and all for all intents and purposes, it's not really even more of a regular silent film, but it does represent an interesting place and time and a culture that's trying to come up. And yeah, the representation here is definitely ahead of its time. Yeah, and it's and it's a short movie too, and we really surmise the whole the whole thing pretty easily. Mm-hmm. And so now we're just like, uh, what else do we talk about? We went through it in like 12 minutes. Right? I think we just rated. it. Are we did? We're going to have, have another a short episode. Maybe I'll drop the Clifford ep- episode to the day after we drop this mm. so that we can have two very short episodes back to back. Makes sense to me. You know, you see some YouTube like documentaries explaining other things. There's so many YouTube channels that are spending time talking about other YouTubers. And I swear to God, they're like three hour long documentaries. It's like, who is watching that? Like, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, I guess our episodes, they usually average out around a half hour, but we don't have to go a half hour every time, do we? No. Borderline. Borderline. There's a lot of movies apparently called Borderline that came out. It's a Madonna song. But look it up from 1930, directed by Kenneth McPherson, starring your boy, Paul Robeson. Next week, we will be in the talkie era of Paul Robeson. So. I'm excited about that. Yes, me too. He did get famous singing the song uh, Old Man River on the James Well movie Showboat. That's how he blew up. And he would later get buried in the McCarthy era, uh, red, red baiting, red scaring, whatever they call it. He's definitely a guy that... Um, yeah, he, he we're we're kind of pairing him with Denzel this month, but they are they do seem to be strikingly different, you know, people. But it is kind of interesting to see the the greatest then the greatest now, right? Mm-hmm. How different they are, and in this whole week, it's kind of all about race, isn't it? And that's because uh, Wednesday uh, we'll be talking about Malcolm X. So come back for that with our Denzel Spike Lee joint, but. How much would you rate uh, this film, Borderline, by Kenneth McPherson? This experimental artsy-fartsy. Shut up. Shut up. I I don't like it because it's so artsy-fartsy. Because of how ahead of its time it was, and I do think there were some really good moments in this movie, but it did really drag. But I think ultimately I'm going to give it a 3.25. I think it's a solid three-er. For yeah. sure. 6.25 for Borderline. Yes, 6.25. Uh, right alongside movies like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Rabid, and X-Men. It's as good as... This, this movie's as good as X-Men. They're very similar, yeah, too. Yeah. It's like uh, the same. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's the same. They're uh, advanced humans trying to make their way in a world that hates and fears them. It is like X-Men. Huh? <laughs> It is like X Men. <laughs> it's like proto X Men here. Okay. Well, check the show notes for links and other places to find us. Uh, you can watch. You can find this movie on YouTube if you want to check it out. You're into little film history. I recommend it. Uh, what do you think about it? If you think anything at all. If you don't think, say then comment. I don't think <laughs> under this video. And uh, like, subscribe, and uh, we'll talk to you again very soon. Thoughts and prayers to the haters.